Uh, all right, we're live. Good, thanks. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, be real quick. Welcome to uh, the second to last meeting. We got one more meeting besides this one next week, and then we're off for the summer. Usually, we're off earlier, but um, we wanted to get through the book, so we just have two more chapters tonight and next week. So we're going to show you a little video here of uh, Francis Chan. And I always have the uh, the urge to call him, and it's no slur. It Jackie Chan for some reason, but this is Francis Chan. So uh, get a look at this video. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. <laughs> You, 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 you study it, you memorize You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? But they memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey, Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> he said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said? And talk about how much we know. But it's just it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I would start making disciples. That's so good. Just that look, but that's an important uh, the important part of what we're gonna be talking about today with Peter. So we're gonna continue with the second to last um, guy on the book, How God Makes Men, 10 Epic Stories, 10 Proving Principles, One Huge Promise for Your Life. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did Nehemiah. That was with a broken wall. And this is uh, that saying for, for Nehemiah that Morley has. And the next one we did last week was Job. And that was that uh, statement for Job. And the question from last week is, what is God doing inside you during your suffering? Just like Job, what is God doing inside, uh, inside you during your suffering? So that was last week's question that you had to think about for this week. We're going to talk about that in, in a small group. We have our small group questions. So today is Peter. Peter, uh, in the statement for Peter, Morley says, God makes men by a process of calling equipping and sending us so we can call, equip, and send others. But remember what uh, Francis Chan said, so it's going to be kind of pinnacle throughout tonight as well, of uh, not just memorizing uh, and reading, but actually doing. So we know we have a lot of, uh, of issues with our society. There's problems with our society, right? There's divorce, there's fathers, boys, there's domestic abuse, pornography, rampage, shootings, Wall Street corruption, racism, poverty, normalcy of the sin in media. We know these are things that are common in our, in our own culture. So what about Christian men? So what's uh, the, some stats here for you. 85% of men in America believe in God. 62% of men in America identify as Protestant, Catholic, or Christian. That's what we are. Uh, so 31% of Christian men in America attend church weekly. So look at these numbers. We have 85%. They believe in God in 62 and 31. But if we do a little math, 31% of that 62, the 31 for that 62% was men that say they're Christian or identify as Christian and only 31% attend church weekly. So that's one in five Christian men attend church weekly. So how many out of men out of those are really disciples? How could you we're going to define this word disciple a little bit or discipleship or discipling. 
and sometimes that scares us, but we're going to cover that a little, a little deeper. If we were to believe scripture, what scripture says, the gospel changes everything. The word of God through Christ coming and saving us. If we really believe what God's word says and everything in it, then this word of discipleship is going to be uh, very important. So the thing that we talked about a little earlier or looked at with the percentages, uh, what we believe and what we do are often two entirely different things. Frankly, that's really shameful and that it's not at all biblical manhood. So let's go into the scripture. If we really believe what it says um, in, in this word, pronounced ma ti ma ti ma Mathitas, Mathitas, really is a learner or a follower, but it's not just a Facebook follower or somebody we see, I'm just following this football team or this basketball team or this pro team. It's actually committing your life to those ideals or that theology. So it's a deeper meaning. This Greek here is telling us it's a learner or follower. So um, this, this, uh, let me shrink this down. There we go. So we are called by God to salvation. We are equipped to live as a Christian and we are sent to live Jesus and make disciples. So we're actually to be his life, to be Christ is to follow him and to follow what it means to be a discipler uh, and to make disciples. So this is really big with me and the disciple, this is what men on fire uh, for me really says uh, a lot about not just what Francis Chan was alluding to of, of um, reading and memorizing and not doing. It's not about us coming to these meetings or coming when we gather uh, to share our lives with each other in small group. It's not just to have that fun, chummy time. There is some discipling that's going on, some reciprocal discipling. And the way we're going to look at discipling uh, is a huge moral main issue in Scripture. It's a very, very major issue what Christ talks about. And what Todd will be talking about here a little later in some detail, but it's disciples making uh, disciples. If you look at your book on page 140, um, Morley talks about, um, I'm just going to read a short paragraph in regards to this. God has given us a clear, simple prescription to bring men to maturity. It's not for mature men to take younger men under their wings and show them how to walk I'm sorry, it's for mature men to take younger men under their wings and show them how to walk the Christian life. Men are his method. We, he equips us to reach other men because it takes a man to teach a man how to be a man. That's a great, great paragraph in there. So that is a more main moral issue. So we get to the problem and the solution. So it's disciples making disciples. Problems get solved when the right kind of people are trying to fix them, disciples. Another point on 140, uh, right underneath that one paragraph in the middle that I read earlier, in a real sense, the cure for everything starts with men's discipleship. That's the way Jesus saw it. So, and it was no coincidence that Jesus picked 12 men. Obviously, at that time in the culture, women were not as, uh, you know, wouldn't have been as equal to get 12 women. So, but God, in his infinite wisdom, choose men to be a leader in that society. And even now, that hasn't changed. Not to say one sex is better than the other. It's that our, um, our requirement, what we are called to do as men, we can change the world. So in his quote here, we show, get men right, get marriages right, get marriages right, get families right, get families right, get the church right, get the church right, God will change the world. So, and again, the solution isn't to split up the authority, but it's to use men and women as discipling others. But men have a major, major impact. And this is where Men on Fire comes into that major impact of making a difference in our culture, in our church, in our family. So what he's saying is this being a disciple, a follower, really a scripture mandates us. It's a moral issue. We should be doing it. It's not a gift for one and only a few Every man, everyone that calls himself a Christian should be discipling, should be nudging other people on to, to being a disciple and to train them to be disciples as well. And you'll see this difference in our culture uh, and our world as we uh, try this. And uh, we, we're kind of scared of that word and thinking that it's over, we're going to be uh, overly 
it's going to be difficult and it's time consuming, but it really is got some very simplistic patterns to it that we can follow what Christ does. And, and we're going to talk a little, Todd's going to talk a little bit about that process of how that's done. All right. So um, in this uh, chapter, Morley picks out the Apostle Peter um, as the example of uh, just the model of showing how Jesus discipled Peter. And uh, Peter wasn't like the model Christian guy. Of course, they weren't called Christians back then, but um, uh, it wasn't like, you know, the, the, the Jesus picked him out and said, you know, that you stand out among others to be a great preacher, to the build the church on. Uh, we go back to actually when he first met him. And uh, here's where he, he bumps into him at the side of the water. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. You are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. Lift up your head, fisherman. I will do. Follow me. I will.
So why did Jesus choose Peter? We don't know. Uh, the Bible never really says. Uh, but it, what it doesn't say is that he came out of a super awesome family or um, that he was a, a model student, um, that he was an upright and moral guy. Uh, in fact, the, it even shows in the scene he was very aware that he didn't have some things in his life together that measured up according to uh, the religion of the day back then and Judaism, uh, the laws of that. But um, it wasn't very complicated. Um, Jesus didn't come and say, uh, call him to a bunch of rules and say, you have to change your life. You have to stop doing this and start doing this. He didn't say, do you want to convert to my religion? Um, he just invited him into a relationship. Um, and so it wasn't a real complex process, this discipleship thing that we make it out to be. In Mark 3, 14, it kind of sums up Jesus' whole plan. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. Um, and with him is, is a huge statement, um, because that would mean that being with Jesus a lot and spending time with him, he didn't give them a title and then leave them on their own, but he said, he found this, these men, uh, younger than him and said, uh, I want you to spend time with me. I want you to listen to me. I want you to watch me. I want to pour my life into you and teach you. And obviously it was different than just mentoring to be a good guy, but mentoring the things of God and showing you who you can be and who you're created to be in the eyes of his father. Um, but Peter's known, I, I like that he chose him as one of the disciples um, that he kind of highlighted in this book. Uh, because Peter was well known uh, for being vocal and being first out of the gate to ask a lot of questions. Um, and that was a lot of the mentoring and a lot of the discipleship that happened with Jesus when it came to Peter. Um, there's a lot of famous scenes in the Bible where you read where Jesus is talking and the first one to ask a question or the first one to make a statement is Peter right out of the gate. Um, uh, obviously, um, there's the, uh, you know, times when he said, explain this parable to me and, uh, you know, t t explain further, Jesus, I don't get it. You know, tell me more. Uh, how many times do I forgive someone, Jesus? That was Peter when he said, forgive people. Well, how many times? Let's define that. Let's, let's be more specific, Jesus. Uh, when Jesus was talking about, um, uh, you know, where, uh, the, the things were going to be happening in the coming weeks and leading up to his death. You know, well, when will these things happen? Give me a specific date or a time. And then when Jesus was talking about heaven and different things, well, where are you going then? And why are you leaving us? What's, what's going on? So he was always asking, and Jesus never shut him down uh, when he asked genuine questions trying to understand because he understood that with Jesus it was sharing spiritual things uh, that were foreign to these guys and that were really speaking to their soul. And obviously when Jesus used earthly words, a lot of times they carried heavenly meanings, but he was patient. And a lot of discipleship is just simply asking questions and uh, back and forth dialogue, just conversation. It's just not that hard uh, to have that kind of relationship. Um, but Peter obviously did have some stumbles along the way. He wasn't the perfect man. And, uh, and his discipleship and his relationship with Jesus, there were some rocky times as well. Uh, Peter's known for his questions, but also his stumbles. Um, you know, when uh, uh, it says never Lord up there, that's when um, Jesus said that uh, he would be uh, going to the garden and that and he would be crucified. And Peter just said, no way, never Lord, I don't think so. And didn't realize he's telling the savior of the universe that no, he's wrong. Um, when Jesus wanted to wash the disciples' feet as a servant in John, uh, Peter says, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Again, like he's the first one, like, I mean, with pure motive that he was like saying, I'm not worthy. But again, he steps in the way of like telling Jesus what to do. He's the one that stepped in and cut the ear off the high priest's servant. And then we most remember Peter probably for one of his uh, uh, big failures is that he denied knowing Jesus three times when he needed him most. He denied actually knowing Christ at all and uh, to save his own behind. Um, so this process of discipleship was not necessarily a smooth uh, process. Um, it was just doing life with Jesus. But obviously Jesus was the savior of the universe and this was a human man. 
And uh, so uh, Peter stumbled along, um, but that didn't knock him out. He was down at times when he was not out. In fact, finally we hear with Peter um, that Jesus tells him, I also say that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And it's really interesting if you see in that graphic that um, Jesus uses two words that mean rock in that. And when he says you're Peter, meaning what you are right now, you're a fragment, you're a stone, you're a, you're a small pebble and, and stuff. But on this rock, Peter, on you, you will become this boulder, this immovable mass, this, this, um, this foundation for which Jesus will put his entire church on. So isn't it interesting that it's the one guy that Jesus picks out that's the most vocal, bold, brash, puts his foot in his mouth all the time, um, denied Jesus three times, cut the ear off the soldier. Um, the, probably the guy that you and I would go, I don't know if I really trust this guy. He's kind of a loose cannon. He's getting in trouble all the time. And he's the one that actually Jesus says, not John, not Andrew, not Bartholomew, but Peter, I'm going to build my church upon you. Um, and so it was a successful discipleship process that Peter got it and was ready to launch out and to carry on and disciple others the things that Jesus had taught him. Discipleship's not a hard thing. Uh, Tim and I both like this moniker. Um, we might put it on a t-shirt soon or something like that, but um, disciple, be one, make one. Um, it's as simple as like Paul said in 2 Timothy, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Um, it's just simply passing on what we already know. And so discipleship, typically we knock ourselves out and say, well, I'm not a disciple person because I don't know enough, a Bible. Other people know more than me. Other people have life experiences on me. And it's just Paul saying, teach what you know and pass on. As Jesus made a difference in your life, as soon as you become a Christian and say you're going to follow him and repent or baptize, you know something that some people in the world don't that you've received. And so you become a person to disciple others. You have information to pass on to them and to share. The other part that I highlighted says that trustworthy people, discipling is not the same as witnessing as street witnessing and that kind of thing. Um, there might be a place for that, but disciple means uh, when you disciple someone, you mutually decide that you're going to spend time with someone, typically someone younger um, or younger in the faith than you are and uh, that you decide that they, they want this, that you can trust that they desire to be discipled and to know more about Jesus. And so you enter into a relationship and you intentionally spend time. It's not just like the witnessing where you just kind of like, I'm just gonna be a Christian in the workplace. I'm gonna try to make right decisions and hope that people catch the fact that I'm a Christian. This is much more intentional than that. It's asking people to be imitators of us just as we're imitators of Christ, which Paul said in 1 Corinthians. So it's, it's spending time and talking about the things of Jesus, but it's allowing people to be around us, which is risky because at times we're not imitators of Jesus and they might have to talk about that, about how we messed one up or that kind of thing. Um, but it's being vulnerable and saying, I, I want you around me because I want you to know that Jesus has changed my life. And this is a definition of discipleship I just found on the internet. It said, when you be with people that you're intentionally loving and leading while you have on your heart, was as on the heart of God. And it's just being with someone else intentionally, loving and leading them, specifically men, um, and thinking about the things of God, believing that God's spirit's gonna give you the words to say or make some supernatural things happen when you spend time with other men. It all comes down to the nudge, guys. Um, discipleship is, uh, seems to be a really hard word um, to say and to think about as a concept. And again, if we compare it to the, the Bible disciples, it knocks us out already. Well, those guys were Jesus disciples and they did mighty things and were martyrs and I'm just Todd and how can I, how can I make disciples? It's about the nudge. It's about nudging others a little bit closer to Jesus. I even like that I found this picture where there's a bunch of crap in the picture and the mom elephant is kind of like, or maybe it's a boy elephant, I can't see, but is pushing the uh, elephant around the poop and stuff, which is part of the nudge. Sometimes in mentoring and in, in a discipleship, you're pushing younger men to avoid some of the poop, but you're also pushing them to live in Christ, to live like Christ and to live for Christ as much as possible. So this is the big question for the night as we go into small groups. Uh, are you a disciple? 
Um, are you truly a disciple? I sent out uh, a text, which you may have gotten before you came to group, that disciple is used in the New Testament, the word disciple, uh, some 200 and something times. Uh, and yet the word Christian is only used three times. And it's actually used as kind of like a sort of mocking way that people in the Bible were looking at these new Christians and they called them little Christ. And so they're running around trying to be just like Jesus and, and uh, they're silly little followers. So actually, when the word Christians use, it's even kind of derogatory. So disciple is a big deal in the Bible. and It's a big deal to Jesus. And it was obviously the last thing that he said when he was on earth is go and make disciples. You know, when you hear about people in their last dying breath or when you last have to say goodbye to someone, those words have meaning. There's a big deal that Jesus said to go and to make disciples. So are you a disciple of Jesus or do you just believe in him? And then if you are a disciple, then it begs the next question. Are you discipling someone else? Are you sharing Jesus with someone else intentionally on a regular basis and doing that? Remember that a disciple in the Greek meant to follow. Uh, it meant to learn from someone. And it was like to a rabbi. It wasn't saying that, okay, I'm going to listen, I'm going to listen to their podcast or I'm going to um, uh, just follow their tweets that, that, that actually I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate my life to be like their life and to follow them called by God to salvation, equipped to live as a Christian and sent to live Jesus to make disciples. That's what a disciple is. We're called, we're equipped and we're sent and we're supposed to do the same thing for others. And so we're going to talk about that in small groups in just a little bit.